Well, good morning. Friends, it's good to be with you today. I want to invite you to open your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 1. And we are continuing in this uh, series entitled Renew, talking about our vision. What does renewal look like for our church? And uh, as you're turning in your, uh, in your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 1, last week I shared the conviction that we are fundamentally a story-formed community. Do you remember this? Yes? Okay. Otherwise, I'll tell last week's sermon again. How about that? No, we're a story-formed community. And like the w- rabbits of Watership Down, we are not bound together by a bunch of common interests. We are bound together by the radical stories of Jesus Christ, of the scriptures, of God's activity in our world. And so it's those stories that, that bind us together. We're a part of the dramatic story of Jesus and his activity in our world. And so I also shared a, a bit of how I don't think people are fundamentally moved and motivated by mission statements or vision bullet points, but they're moved by that story, that radical story. And so, so if you don't understand that we're moved by that story, you won't understand next week when I share with you a bit of our focus statement that we've arrived at as a leadership that I'll be beginning to share with you next week. So uh, keep that in mind. But this week, this week I want to talk about the second necessary aspect to vision. As a church, it's one thing to know yourself, to know your soul, your, your code as we call it, the DNA, the deeply held values you hold as a church. But it's quite another thing to know who God has called you to reach. How do you live out those values in such a way that people are being reached? And I would argue that any vision that's born of God re- requires the burden of this one thing that we're going to talk about today. But as I started last week... It is contrary to the visions and dreams that our culture is dreaming. It is contrary to the visions and dreams that we're bombarded with every single day that say, be safe, be comfortable, buy more stuff. That's what Amazon Prime was made for. Then you'll have a meaningful life. Then, Then you'll... You'll be satisfied, right? We know that doesn't happen. Nobody puts stuff down in their obituary. We all want to be part of something bigger. We want to be a part of something more dramatic, changing the world, even if it's in a, in a very uh, pietistic, a simple, and humble way. So I want to share with you what this one thing is because it greatly affected the way that our visioning happened among our session and how we discerned. So, Let's take a look at the text this morning. It's a passage and story we should be familiar with as we studied it last year. The story of Nehemiah. The story of Nehemiah. Starting with chapter 1. Uh, let me just give you a little preface because I love this book. In fact, this is probably one of my favorite books in the Bible. I'd say it's, it's right up there. But several things make this story uh, relevant to our day. The one that I find most encouraging is that there are no overt miracles in this story. The book of Nehemiah, the story of Nehemiah, is one of hard work and prayer and behind-the-scenes divine intervention. But but Nehemiah doesn't pull any, like, you know, miracle cards out of his sleeve. He doesn't have the ace in his pocket. He just, he has to work hard. And I think if we had the ability, each of us had the ability just to heal, or we could part the waters with one flick of our wrist, we wouldn't find it as meaningful We wouldn't find this vision work as satisfying as when we're engaged in uh, the hard work prayer and uh, uh, hard discernment it takes to think about vision. So, a little backdrop for our text. Around 587 BC, the Babylonians invaded Judah. And they leveled the city of Jerusalem along with Solomon's temple. Remember, what's the temple signify for the people? It's where God what? dwells, right? It's the dwelling place of God. And this is the third of three campaigns into that region. All three times, the Babylonians took a host of Israelites as captives and brought them back to Babylon. Can you imagine if we were invaded and someone took a whole host of Tacomans with them and held them captive somewhere else? And uh, the first time that we see this invasion happen, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were taken during that time. So we're familiar with some of those stories, perhaps. About 70 years after the first Babylonian invasion, Cyrus, who is the king of Persia, who had since conquered the Babylonians, I know it gets confusing, but he gave the Jews permission to go back to Jerusalem and build the temple. 
And so it's under the leadership of a man named Zerubbabel. Isn't that a great word? Great, great name. I dare somebody to name their baby that. I'd love to baptize, baptize Zerubbabel in the name of the... Uh, these, these, uh, these Jews came back, and they were, they were exiled, but they came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And things were looking up for a while. People were flourishing. They're thinking, God's hand and presence is now back in this great city of ours. But pretty soon, they started churning away from God and, and started sinning in the ways God had told them. You can't sin in that way. He started judging them for those sins. And they started acting like uh, the cultures around them. And so they were judged. They were judged just like their ancestors were in the days of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. And as a result, the temple wasn't being maintained. Sacrifices had ceased. The Jews continued to adopt all these religious practices and, and uh, pagan rituals from the cultures surrounding them and the nations. And, and by the time our passage begins, the political, social, and spiritual conditions in Jerusalem were deplorable. The wall was destroyed. The gates were broken. They were ripe for invasion again and for, for suffering. So, all the way back in Persia, there's a man named Nehemiah. And he hears about the brokenness of his home city. Let's read this text today. And when we end the reading, I want to ask you to join me in saying thanks be to God if you're thankful for God's word this morning. Let's, let's read this passage, starting with verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at their farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. What's that place? Remember? The temple, right? Verse 10. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So Nehemiah hears of what's happening in Jerusalem, and he felt something. In fact, he felt it so deeply that our text tells us he wept. He shares openly. He wept. And as the story will soon reveal, Nehemiah was not the sort of man who wept at the drop of a hat. He wasn't weak. He was burdened. He was burdened. And his burden drove him to a different vision for his life. A vision that would take him from the comforts of the king's company. Never having an empty belly. Never having to sleep outside. He was in the comfort of the king. Even if he served just as cupbearer. Which still was a position of privilege. And little did he know that this burden that he started to feel that made him weep. Was the beginning of a vision that people would be reading about thousands of years later. And at this point... Really, I think the point of this is that Nehemiah's vision 
didn't begin as a vision. It began as a burden. Nehemiah's vision didn't begin as vision. It began as burden. A burden for his nation and its people. And it would drive him from the comforts and security of being the cupbearer to the king. Burden drives us from comfort and security. On January 12, 2010, a magnitude 7.0 earthquake hit the island of Haiti, killing close to 200,000 people. Haiti's largest city of Port-au-Prince experienced massive damage. They don't have the, the sort of building codes we do. And uh, much of the city was lying in rubble. And the whole world felt the burden for that nation, the burden for those people But as rescuers tried to save the lives of those who were trapped beneath the rubble, just 90 miles away, get this, just 90 miles away, 3,000 tourists were stepping off of a Royal Caribbean cruise ship to enjoy the cruise line's private beach resort in Labadee, Haiti. And just beyond the guarded gates of the beach was a local community dealing with their country that had experienced one of the worst natural tra- disasters they'd have ever experienced. It set up a real-life state of ethical responses that are still being examined today. On one hand, the passengers aboard that ship had paid money to be served. They are the beneficiaries of the ship's service. But others aboard the ship, when faced with the real needs around, around them, the reality of the nearby need, felt they felt this incredible burden inside them. With the loss of life being reported, the needs for food and water, both in Labadee and just miles away in Port-au-Prince. The ship alone held tens of thousands of bottles of water. Had enough food to feed a small city. Have you been on a cruise ship? Right? I think the buffet line alone could feed a small city, right? But all of those resources, the food and the water, all of it tragically stayed on the ship. Why? Despite calls from some of its passengers to ease the burden of rescue workers and the injured, one passenger actually remarked, I think many of us would associate with this sense, I can't imagine having to choke down a burger and pina colada knowing how many have died and how many are dying of thirst and who will die of their injuries. We must do something. But other passengers were put out. One such passenger commented, There's no reason this should ruin my vacation. We can't help them. And I will happily spend what I can on goods to help the locals working in Labadee. A passenger who was on board a different ship, the Carnival, a Carnival Miracle in the Caribbean, when the quake hit, uh, told media that passengers weren't told about the tragedy until the next day. And this passenger commented, We wished Carnival would do something. Food, water. Granted, passengers were on vacation, but that didn't mean they stopped caring about humanity. Imagine if you were on that ship. This incident is a microcosm of a bit of the tension that we must be aware of uh, ourselves in the church and to which Nehemiah experienced himself. A burden for broken people and a burden for a broken city is often at odds with comfort and consumerism. You've heard me say this at least a dozen times in the last six months if you're regularly in worship. You have to be aware of how your personal preferences, often we call it consumerism, but it's your personal preferences, are at odds with kingdom purposes. And to not let personal preferences trump kingdom purposes. This is the problem we see in the church. I share this in every membership class so much so that we actually have a full section in our membership classes now on the topic of church and consumerism. And this uh, idea that we hear all the time of church shopping, right? And the idea is that you, you shop to find a church that will meet your needs, right? You're the member. You're finding membership in a church where you're the beneficiary. You pay good money to be on this cruise ship. Don't you? This, this is the place you come to release burdens, right? This is, this is the place where we seek comfort from the Lord, right? Right? Consumerism toward church can be so destructive 
to the gospel mandate to love our neighbor and practice hospitality. The shift from members as beneficiaries to members as missionaries is difficult because consumerism and comfort promise the release from burdens, not the acquiring of them. When's the last time you bought a product that said, if you buy this, your life will be harder, right? No. Advertisements try to, try to grab a hold of this sentiment that, no, if you buy this, life will be easier. You'll actually have it easier if you were to acquire this thing. But Nehemiah shows us that God vision, God-given vision, will most always begin as burden, not comfort. It'll start as burden. You will hear or see something that gets your attention. Maybe it's a, it's a thought about an injustice. Maybe it's a thought about the future, and it'll generate some emotions in you, and it'll start kind of wrestling in your stomach. What do I do with this? Something will bother you about what is currently, and you'll start thinking, but shouldn't it be better? Shouldn't it be something different? Shouldn't it be? Could it be? And friends, I'm not talking about passing concern here. My kids, uh, uh, several weeks ago, we were on the deck and they were having popsicles. And, and they, were, they were worked up that the neighbor kids didn't get a chance to enjoy our popsicles. They wanted to go shop the popsicles around the neighborhood. We had to say, no, it's okay. I'm not talking about passing concern like creature comforts extended to our neighbors. I'm talking about very real burden. Burden that you aren't able to let go because it won't let you go. These are, these are God-given burden. Not, not good ideas. They're God ideas about burden for our city. And Nehemiah's concern over the condition of, of Jerusalem consumed him. He fasted. He wept. He prayed for days on end. Up to four months, we're told. He, he was doing this. It broke his heart. Thoughts of what, what is in Jerusalem as opposed to what should be, what could be. They brought him to tears and it changed his countenance before God. This burden he was carrying was being transformed into a vision that God was making. Do you hear what I'm saying? When we began this visioning process, we didn't start thinking, hey, what's our burden? What's the burden of our city? Uh, What's the burden of others? We, We didn't think to start there, but we arrived there. We actually had three fundamental questions that we had to ask when we started this visioning process two years ago. The one is, who are we? Really? Who are we as a, as a church here at UPC, really? Not who we aspire to be, but who are we really? We listened to a lot of stories. I talked about this last week, how we're a story-formed community. We listened to the stories of members who've been here many, many years. We looked at some of the archives. We did small group focus groups. We did all sorts of, We listened to stories. And we arrived at this sense of our code. This is our DNA, who we are as a church. Who are we? The deeply held values that get enacted in our life together. That's why our code is such a big deal. It's our story. We lose our code, we lose our soul. Okay? Who are we really? We we got an answer to that question. The second question that we were led to then, that really I'm talking about today is, who are we called to reach? Who are we called to reach? Okay? The third question is, who, uh, what do we need to do to reach them? What do we need to do to reach them and are we willing? I'm going to talk about that in the coming weeks. But, uh, burden addresses the second question. Go back to the second question if you can. Who we are, UPC collectively, who are we called to reach? If Nehemiah was a picture of the church, who are we called to reach together? What is our collective burden? Not a bunch of individual burdens that we may carry, but collectively, what are the kind of burdens that we carry? What brokenness in our city breaks our hearts? What makes us weep and keeps us up at night? What is that? So let's talk about our city. I get real specific here. I want to show you a five-mile radius uh, around UPPC. This is it. This is the the sweet spot, they say. For a church our size, this is the place we're called. This is the five-mile radius of UPPC. You notice it bridges across the water a little bit, okay? Okay. Not a whole lot of people to be reached in the, in the waterway there, but, uh, but who knows? There's some boaters who don't know Jesus yet. Um, but here's the five-mile radius, okay? And most of us, most of us live, we go to school, we work in that five-mile radius, okay? One of those things. We live, work, or, uh, 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 or go to school in that five-mile radius. Some of us are outside of it, and that's great. But for the most part, this is our five-mile sweet spot. We, also, we learned through our process of doing a mission study 
that in that five-mile radius, there are 80,000 people who do not know the love of Jesus. 80,000 people. They're not part of a faith community or they're disengaged from a faith community. 80,000 people. Second thing, we found out that there is a 22% higher than national average of divorce and single parent families. Is that a surprise? There's the national norm, and that five mile radius exceeds it by almost a quarter. 22%, in fact. There are a lot of people in this room and in our church who've gone through divorce themselves, or they've gone through divorce, uh, experienced divorce through their parents, or they've seen friends or family experience divorce. That is a heartbreaking experience. We have a lot of empathy and a lot of gifts to offer a community that's experiencing that kind of brokenness, don't we? You want some good news? Let me share some good news. Uh, we, in our series with James Chung, talked a lot about generations, and I can't unpack every generation, but I'll help you uh, bridge a little bit of this. Uh, the silent and builder generation, the silent generation of those who were aged 68 to 87, and the builder generation was just before them, uh, aged 88 and over, respectively. They make up 10% of the population of the radius. But do you know how much they represent uh, our church membership? 33%. They're 10%, uh, one out of every 10 individuals in that five-mile radius is a part of the silence or builder generation. But we have 33% of our members in that age group. So we are nailing that demographic, okay? Give a high five to your neighbor, okay? Boom. That was weak. Come on, come on. We are nailing it, right? Give ourselves a high five. You have to just give yourself a high five. What's interesting, the largest generation in our country, the largest generations are both the boomers and the millennials. We learned this during the James Chung series, the boomers and millennials. But do you know the largest generation present in our five-mile radius? Do you know what it is? It's actually Generation X. This is abnormal. This is not the norm around the country. But a majority of people in our context, aged 31 to 51, are the Generation Xers. Any guesses as to what percentage of our membership in this church is Generation X? In your head, make a guess. It's just under 12% at 196 members. We actually have more members in this church, get this, more members in this church from the younger generation than Generation X, the millennial generation, born after 1985. You know the ones that supposedly don't go to church and aren't members? We have more of those millennials than we do Generation X. Is that a problem? Is that a burden? The generation that is the sweet spot of raising kids right now, Generation X, and having a family, and developing a marriage, and to which we have historically been good at reaching, is not being reached. It's not being reached, friends. A couple years ago, I remember I was sitting in a small group circle with a, a couples group that Jane and I were a part of, and uh, there was an observation that one of uh, the, the individuals in our group made, uh, uh, one of the women in our group, and all of the women chimed in when they heard this. She said, I'm starting to notice that down in the nursery... There aren't any babies. And she felt burden over that. Why why aren't there any babies in the nursery? Our group had a conversation about what what are we noticing about the change to UPPC? Couple that reality with the most common aged individual in our five-mile radius. What I mean by that is, what do you think the the most common individual age is? Say like a 25-year-old or a... 58-year-old or a, 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 you know, a 16-year-old. What do you think the most common age is in that five-mile radius? Just shoot out some numbers. 38. 10. Others? What? Under 20, okay? 60 plus? The most common age individual in our five-mile radius is actually 10 years old. We have more 10-year-olds than any other age represented in that five-mile radius. We are a community that's getting... Let me me just tell you what this means. We are a community that is getting younger. The average age of our five-mile radius is getting younger. So you'd think UPPC would be getting younger too, right? Right? Nope. In the last 10... Now, this is the deal. I'm just going to tell you right now. Uh, part, Part of maturing our congregation is helping you see problems. Problems that even your pastor can't solve. 
but problems we must own as a culture here at UPC and as we think about and we dream about and we vision the future of ministry for this place. In the last 10 years, the average age of a member here at UPC has gone from 2005, 63% of our members were under the age of 55, 37% were over 56. Now, 10 years later, 42% under 55, 58% over 56. We've almost switched it. Do you think it's important to talk about what's going to happen in the next 10 years of UPC's life as a church? Do you? Do you? I hope you do. I hope you do because we're called to a community that, for the most part, is telling us Gen Xers, the family sweet spot, that's the generation that we've got a predominant number of. That's also the generation that UPC historically has nailed We have been good at helping and encouraging families, help them raise their children, help them in that that kind of chaos of of the family years, right? We got a lot of grandma and grandpas in this place that that can help, right? That should be burdening. It burdens me. I know it burdens a lot of us. We are, as as a church, getting older while our community is getting younger. So what do we do about that, UPPC? What do we do about that? I think it's helpful to look at Nehemiah. This is why I love this book. What did he do? He didn't sneak away across the desert in the night. He didn't just rush to throw a bunch of solutions towards the problem. He didn't make up a reason to leave Persia, lie about it. He certainly didn't do what most people are doing in our day. He didn't start criticizing the priests. He didn't start uh, criticizing the people of Jerusalem. By the way, what criticism does is it, it absolves us of responsibility. So does victimization. Victimization and criticism are both efforts to absolve ourselves of responsibility. We place the responsibility and blame on others. That's not what Nehemiah did. This is fascinating. Nehemiah didn't do that. Nehemiah didn't even... Uh, do what some people do, which he didn't start, you know, uh, ignoring his responsibilities as cupbearer to the king and, and let that distract, or even bury his head in work and distract himself from the burden that gripped his heart. Instead, he chose, I think, the most difficult way. He chose to wait. Four months, according to the Babylonian calendar, Nehemiah knew what so many of us have a hard time remembering. What could be and should be can't be until God is ready for it to be. So he waited and he prayed. I think there's a lot of wisdom in letting the vision mature in us when we go to prayer. But not only does our vision mature, we mature. We mature. Often we aren't ready. We think the tendency, I think my tendency is, maybe this is true of you, my tendency is, okay, I know what I'm called to do now. I'm going to go charge that hill and do some good work, right? I'm going to, Tackle that problem. And often I think, because I know what I'm to do, I'm ready to do it. But that's not the case, is it? Often God has to grow us into our vision. And it's so neat to see how God's been doing that at UPPC. There's this collective buzz, this energy, this desire to turn outward towards our community. I think Compassion Day was a beautiful example of that. To partner with other churches and stop drawing territorial lines around our churches and instead to embrace the fact there's only one church. It's Jesus' church in our community, okay? So not only is a vision born in our church when we are gripped by the tension of what is and what could be or should be, but like pregnancy, it's nurtured in the waiting. It's nurtured in that time. So Nehemiah waited four months and he prayed and he planned. You know, when you have a burden, prayer keeps the burden fresh. I love how Nehemiah keeps the burden fresh. It made him expectant. Prayer doesn't force God's hand, but it keeps us on the lookout for opportunities and his intervention. And Nehemiah prayed for two things in reference to his vision. First, he prayed for an opportunity. Just look at verse 11. Let's read this all together in one loud voice. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Nehemiah wanted an opportunity to share his vision 
with the king. He knew it would take divine intervention for that to go well, so he prayed for success. You know, I think our tendency, I think our tendency is to pray for miracles, not opportunities. I think our tendency is to pray for some miraculous way to reach the next generation, to reach broken families. You know what? Maybe we could have a miracle. A great pastor. A hero that would represent that desire to reach that generation. By the way, that is the pastoral heroism phenomenon in America that is fundamentally failing. It takes us together. To reach those generations. It takes all of us. There's, people are no longer attracted to the pulpit. I know, I know I'm a great preacher. I know I am. But, whew, thank you. Stop. Shun flattery. I get it. Uh, but this is no longer the place. This is no longer Christendom, friends. People are not going to be winsomely attracted to someone who can speak from a pulpit. They're going to be interested in a dinner table. They're going to be called to community. They're going to be called to a culture here at UPPC that fosters and invites and is hospitable and says what you have to offer matters and we want to receive it. Next week I'm going to talk about a tendency, and this is going to be wickedly difficult for some in our church, but the tendency for us to get into preservation mode and, uh, and how that distorts the gospel. We'll talk about that next week. But this is what, what Nehemiah did. He prayed for opportunity. What if we were to pray for opportunity, not for a miracle? What if we pray for opportunity for each of us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community? We're going to talk about this when I share a little bit of our vision statement, which will make so much more sense now of how we arrived at some of the words that we did. The four words, in fact. But, but what if you were to pray for opportunity? You know, I always say this about our kids. Whenever I pray for my kids, I used to pray, God, would you just develop character in Natalie? I believe in, some of you heard me say this, I believe in going into my kid's bedroom when they're uh, just, just asleep, the early evening, and I'll put my hands on them. I claim them. I say, Jesus, this is my child. I claim her and him uh, as my own. I sit down, I'll pray for Natalie. I, I used to pray, God, would you give her character? By the way, that's a miracle prayer, right? God, would you just somehow just give her character, right? Miraculously give her something. Now I'm praying, Lord, would you give her opportunities where she can develop character? You see the difference? Give her opportunities. Give her places where she would develop and forge character. Maybe it's for you. You've, in this series where we talk about continuum, you don't really get a chance ever to lead people to Jesus or have spiritual conversations. Maybe it's because you're praying for the wrong thing. Instead of praying for your friend who's lost and doesn't know Jesus, that they'd come to know the love of Jesus— Pray for the opportunity that you would have to share the love of Jesus. Pray for that opportunity, okay? So, I want to close with this. What does this all mean for our community here at Youth PC? And I just want to ask some piercing questions, but I'm not going to answer it for you. I'm just going to ask this. Let me ask you, who are you burdened for in our city that they may know the love of Jesus? Who are you burdened for? Maybe, and, and I, wanna, I don't want to get any emails here, but let me just be sensitive. Okay. Maybe you struggle with not having a burden. Are there, perhaps, just perhaps, are there comfort and consumerism tendencies about the church and about our community meeting your needs primarily? Is that a problem? Is this a growth area for you? Where you need to maybe get outside of your own preferences and start living into some purposes? some opportunities, some ways God would use you. Maybe you have to wrestle with that in your heart. I can't do it for you. You've got to pray to God and ask him about it. Is that how I'm approaching community? Those are some questions for you to think about. Next week, we're going to launch into the question, question three, which, he, which really is, if we're called to reach this community of ours, how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? And are we willing? Let's pray. Jesus, we, we need you now more than ever to help us to shed comfort. Maybe our own preferences for how life will go, how this church does its work. Instead, replace that with burden for broken lives, broken people, broken homes. Lord, I know every one of us wants people to know the love of Jesus. Sometimes we don't know how to share the love of Jesus. Would you help us? God, would you help us to have a burden for those we don't see, 
to have a burden for maybe those who are different than us, those who have different skin color, different cultural background, different age. We know one of the gifts of this church is to be intergenerational, and yet we feel like there's an area of our church that, that we aren't serving very well, this Generation X. Or would you help us to be more creative and to seek opportunities where we can be the love and we can share your love with those around us? Lord, would you continue to give us vision? Lead us in this way, we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen.